Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, this is the last of the seminars of ACUSA 2015. It's been a long year. This is the last one. And before introducing our speaker today, we usually introduce a little bit what ACUSA is for those that um, don't know yet or those that like to, to remember what is this about. <laughs> so, um, I'd like to emphasize something that sometimes is missing because of the title that Spanish scientists in the US uh, is not just about scientists, it's about everyone related to science. It's something that we have to um, get this message uh, along to other people because it's actually about creating a network of scientists, technologists, science teachers, communicators, administrators, everyone who is somehow related to science either in the public or private sector, and to facilitate the exchange of ideas uh, among these people, um, contribute to social awareness, and act also as a point of contact, not just in, in, in America, but also in Spain. Uh, so again, everyone working in science, technology, communication, education, administration, or advocacy, whatever, um, you do, which is related to, to any scientific activity, you all are welcoming ECUSA. And so right now ECUSA is spreading um, along the US. We are already uh, five chapters. Uh, here in green you can see those states where we are already present. We hope to cover the entire country. Um, Recently, we launched uh, the new figure of full member, uh, which uh, we hope will increase in number very quickly. Uh, just to let you know, but you can check more in the, on the website, there are different um, advantages of being a full member with respect to the associate member, which is the one we've had so far. Here you can see some of them um, not only related to uh, events or um, joining the board of directors, but also uh, we hope to have discounts with different um, activities, like in this, in this case with people offer immigration, uh, advocacy, or, or Iberico Club when you want to buy good uh, among. And we have mainly three areas of uh, work. One is professional development, science outreach, and education. These main areas are usually developed through different uh, activities. Uh, you can check more on the website, but here you can see one of the main ones. Um, we organize these seminars. These are the, the ones uh, we will keep doing, in, uh, doing this next year. We have some programs like ECUSA and, and Las Escuelas, which is um, with aims to um, bring science uh, to the schools and work with uh, pupils. Um, we have uh, professional development, uh, very nice professional development activities with the idea of acting as a support for the career since you are in the very early stages to uh, more advanced stages in your career. We have different programs for that. And then um, experts guide. Um, so for those that need an expert in certain topics related to science, we are creating a database for, for providing this information. And well, we organize webinars with the Spanish universities and, and again, many networking activities like Ciencia y Jamón, which is uh, usually uh, done around Cambridge and is a very uh, good idea for, for knowing people. Yeah. Um, very important also, uh, all of, of us working for ECUSA are volunteers, and so it means we are doing this in our free time, and it's very welcome when more people want to join for, for collaborating. So just to encourage you to become a member, and, and now I don't take more time from uh, our speaker tonight, which is Tomás Palacios. Um, the awards he has are countless, so I'm not going to extend on that. I think he's going to tell us a very cool talk about science fiction almost, and about, I think, all those things that keep him awake at night. 
uh, which is mainly trying to solve many important problems um, worldwide using nanotechnology, using science. So please, Tomas, um, join me here. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for your very kind introduction. It's a tremendous pleasure to, to be here today and to be able to share with all of you uh, some of our uh, work at, at MIT to, to try to expand the, the impact uh, and reach of, of electronics in, into the 21st century. So the, the, the title of, of, of my talk is a, a little bit a strange for, for people not working in, in, in electronics, gallium nitride and graphene, extreme materials for, for the future of electronics. But hopefully by, by the end of, of the talk, you will all be experts on, on, on how new, new, new materials are needed in, in order to keep pushing the limits of what is possible in, in electronics and, and hopefully move the limits into really amazing uh, new fields. So the, this is uh, the outline of, of my talk uh, today. I, I'll start with an electronics 101 uh, introduction uh, to, to discuss what, what, what is important to, to remember and what, what is the background that, that, that you should have to, to understand the rest of, of the talk. Uh, and then I'll, I'll be ve very uh, frank and very honest with you. I, I, I'll tell you what, what the challenges are. Basically, electronics has been amazing for, for the last 60 years, but the electronics, are, as we know it today, is it, about to finish. And the problem is that society has got used to exponential increase in electronics. It's because of exponential increase in electronics every year that we have the internet, that we have cell phones, that we have the human genome project, then we can sequence DNA. It's all about computers and about the fact that society can count on doubling the speed of computers every year and a half. When that stops, pretty much every field is going to stop. Hopefully that is not going to happen. But to, to make sure we can push electronics even further, we really need new breakthroughs. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about that uh, today. And I, I will, so after telling you the, the challenges and, uh, and the opportunities, I, I'll give you two, two examples from, from my own uh, research, focus on energy and what we call ubiquitous uh, electronics. And I finalize the, this talk with, with a couple of slides on, on innovation and technology transfer, which is, I, I think, a, a, a very interesting uh, topic also. So electronics, electronics uh, really was changed and, uh, and transformed in December 23rd, 20, uh, 1947, when the first transistor wa was invented uh, at Bell Labs uh, by these uh, three, three scientists, uh, Shockley, Bardeen, uh, and Breton. And this is the, the, the picture of, of the first transistor. This is the, the, the first transistor. This really started the, the electronics uh, revolution. And the actual size was something like, like this, just a, a, a couple of centimeters. And keep in mind that today, in, in any computer, you have at least two or three billion of transistors. So we, we learn how to make this really, really tiny, how to design systems with billions and billions of, of these tiny devices to, to really make amazing things. The way a transistor works is just a switch. A switch that can either be in the on state and it lets the current flow, or in the off state and basically stops the flow of current. So it's just a, a, a switch for, for, for the current. It, it typically has three, three different electrodes or three different uh, connections to the outside world. It has what is called the source and the drain. And those are two, two, two connections to the outside world through which you pass the current. So the, the current flows between the drain and the source. It goes from here to there. And the gate is basically the, the electrode, the, the connection that controls the, the 
open or closed state of the transistor. So if the gate, if you apply a high voltage to the gate, the, the transistor is in the on state and the current can flow from the drain to the source. If you apply a negative voltage to the gate, then this is open, there is no current uh, flow. Uh, it, it's a very, very simple concept, but it enables all the electronics, all the computer science that we have today. Yes, a switch. And this is how the switch works. Basically, you look at the current flowing from the drain to the source, and you have two states. Either in the off state, no current is flowing, zero current, no matter what voltage you connect between the source and the drain, or the on state, where this is basically a short circuit. It's basically like a wire. And a lot of things have changed in the last 60 years since the invention of, of the first transistor. This is how the first transistor looked like. This is how a transistor looks like uh, today. The, the first difference is the dimension. This is a couple of centimeters. This is just 20, 20 nanometers. But the basic idea is still the same. You have a source, a drain, the current flows from the drain to the source, and is controlled by the voltage that you apply here at the gate. But not only we know how to make really, really tiny transistors, and as you make them smaller and smaller, the, the, the transistor is faster and faster. You can turn the device on and off at higher frequencies, just like your computer. But we've also learned how to build systems electronic systems with a, a, a growing level of complexity. So this is the first integrated chip in, in history. This was done by a company called Fairchild Semiconductor. And it's basically yes, a, a couple of transistors where you basically have metal connecting the source and the drain of the devices. Yes, a couple of devices, the first microchip in, in history. This is a modern microprocessor today, where you have billions and billions of really, really tiny, 20 or, or even less a nanometers in, in, in size. Um, a few years after the, the initial integrated circuit, one, one of the founders of, of this company, a Fairchild Semiconductor, he ha happened to, to also start Intel, and these are the, 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 the three founders of, of, of Intel. And one of them, Gordon Moore, came out with what is called Moore's Law, which basically predicts that roughly every year and a half, the number of transistors in a microchip doubles. And this has held true for the last 40 years. So, this is number of transistors in a microchip as a function of time. He came up with Moore's law with only four or five data points, and he basically extrapolated. He said it's going to be more or less a straight line in an exponential plot, and it has whole truth for all these years. And we went from basically a couple of transistors to billions and billions of devices day to day. And if you think about it, it's truly amazing how we are able to design systems with billions of different building blocks, and how we are able to make sure we don't make a single mistake when we design these things that are so, so complicated. But this is really what has enabled us to, to start the, the electronics revolution. This is a, a computer system before transistors were invented. And now we have a, a, an entire revolution that goes from communication to healthcare to games to all kinds of, of, of interesting new, new things. So this is the, what has happened in the last 60 years. Everything is going to change in the next few years. And, and that's because we, we are facing a couple of really huge challenges. And the first one is shown here, is energy. This is how much energy is consumed in the world as a function of time. And, and the problem is that we are using a lot of energy 
every year more and more energy. And that's a problem because it's not sustainable. And we know that uh, we have global warming and, 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 and all, all these bad things that are not only uh, jeopardizing technology but are, are causing huge geopolitical uh, issues. So th this is a problem. Right now, uh, to give you an example of, of how bad this problem is and how bad it can get if we don't do something, right now, something like 3% of the electricity used in the US is being used by basically four or five companies. Uh, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, and a few others. It consume 3% of the electricity in the US. That's the amount of electricity that the internet, the data servers that, 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 that uh, control the internet use. And you could say 3% is not too much. The problem is that that is increasing exponentially. And for any of you who has worked with exponential functions, mm -hmm. an exponential function that keeps growing exponentially and that, is a, that represents a 3% of the electricity today, it's a problem. And that's only one, one very small part of, of, of the energy uh, issue. The second, the second challenge that, that is going to stop uh, electronics as, as we know it today is basically, uh, shown here, uh, this is Moore's law, basically we, we make uh, systems that are more and more complex every, every year. The problem is that we are able to pack more and more transistors by making the transistors smaller and smaller and smaller every year. So this is how a transistor looked like in 2003. It had 90, 90 nanometers between the source and the drain. In 2005, 65 nanometers, 45, 32, 22. Today, we are around 14 nanometers. 14. Uh, next year, we are supposed to be uh, we are supposed to have transistors that are only 10 nanometers in, 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 in size. They are really, really tiny. The problem is that to come up with the technologies to make these very, very tiny devices and make billions and billions of them at, at very low cost is extremely difficult. And because of that, the, 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 the factories, the fabs that we use to, to make these microprocessors are becoming more and more expensive every year. So today, a state-of-the-art semiconductor fab where we make these microprocessors costs $5 billion. In the future, one single fab is expected to cost more than $10 billion. And every semiconductor company that wants to make electronics needs many of these fabs, many. Uh, and they need to build a new one every year and a half or every two years. So it, it is extremely expensive to be in the game of improving electronics. It is so expensive that I think, and many people think, is jeopardizing the future of electronics as we know it today. So those are the bad news. This is really bad news. <laughs> the computer was really scared. <laughs> no, maybe the projector actually. Okay, here it is. Okay. So it was so scary that even the, 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 the computer decided to give up. Uh, now, let, let me tell you the, the, the good news. So, first, uh, with energy. We, we use a lot of energy. Yeah, as, I, as, I saw before, as I showed before, uh, we use huge amount of energy, uh, uh, and we are using more and more uh, every, every day. The good news are in this really basic plot. Uh, what this plot shows is different sources of energy. How do we produce energy? We can produce it through oil, gas, coal, nuclear, solar, wind, hydroelectric, etc. How do we produce energy? And here in the right hand side, we have how we use energy. And we basically either use energy, useful energy, or we waste energy. Each time you, you touch your computer and it's hot, 
that's energy that you're wasting, right? So what I want you to, to, to see in this plot is that actually most of the energy that we produce is wasted. Something like 60% of all the energy that we produce it is wasted as heat. So in reality, we don't really use energy. Our society wastes energy. And from time to time, we use a little bit of energy to, to do computation, drive our cars, uh, have uh, lighting, etc. But our society mainly wastes energy. And that's an opportunity. That's a huge opportunity for electronics. And my, my own group is working on, on a, a new material called gallium nitride it, that is, is basically revolutionizing the, the way we use energy and is allowing us to, to, to have the hope to save a lot of this energy that we are wasting. So if you want to solve the energy problem, sure, you, you can increase the, the, the amount of a photovoltaic installations, you, you can get rid of, of nuclear plants and have hydroelectric energy instead. But I would argue that the simplest, the easiest approach is, is to waste less energy. And that's what you can do with gallium nitride. Gallium nitride is being pursued in the world to save energy in three different, three different applications. First, in lighting. And I, I'll talk a little bit about each one of these. The second application where gallium nitride can, can save significant energy is in what is called power electronics. Anytime you, you use electricity, you need to transform the electricity. Uh, here in the US, you get electricity 110 volts in the uh, outlet, and a computer typically uses 18 volts. So you need to transform the voltage from 110 volts down to 18 volts, for example. And it turns out that you waste a lot of energy when doing that. So that's all power electronics. And then the third area is in communications, uh, to enable cell phones and so on. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, last year was actually awarded to the two Japanese uh, three Japanese scientists who uh, use gallium nitride to revolutionize uh, light. And lighting is actually important, a lot more important than, than you may think, uh, because something like 35% of all the electricity in the world, 35% is used for light. 35%, that's a huge number. And the interesting thing about lighting is that most of the lighting is done through incandescent light bulbs in the world. And the problem with the incandescent light bulb is that it looks very similar to the original light bulb invented by, by Edison. And what is even more important, the efficiency of a conventional incandescent light bulb is very low, 4%. So 96% of the energy that a light bulb uses is wasted as heat. That, that's why an incandescent light bulb it is so hot. And when we are using 35% of the world's electricity in lighting, that basically means that we are wasting almost 35% of the world's electricity. So we can come up with new solar cells. We can come up with new hydroelectric plants. We can be really upset about nuclear energy. But really, the simplest solution is to save 35% of the electricity by making better light. And that's the revolution that gallium nitride started. Because gallium nitride allows you to, to make light bulbs with efficiencies of more than 50%, potentially 80%. And these are the LED light bulbs that are now becoming a mainstream. Uh, and the reason why the government, even in the U.S., it decided to, to push so much for, for LED lighting 
was because they wanted to save 35% of the world's electricity by just changing the way we illuminate uh, our buildings. And that's just the beginning, because in the future, the light bulb, and now that you are adding electronics into light, it, that means that you are going to have electronics in every single room in, in, in our houses. You are going to have electronics in, in, in everywhere. And that allows us to, to have a lot of interest in new opportunities, in, to basically have internet connectivity everywhere, have a, electronics that is able to sense where people are at any time, etc. So the light bulb of the future is going to do a lot more than just illuminating uh, our lives. It's going to have a lot more functionality. And a similar thing is going to happen with, with power electronics. This idea of using electronics to change electricity, it turns out that actually something like 20% of the electricity in, in, the, in, in the world is actually wasted in these conversions of voltage. When you go from high voltage to low voltage or vice versa, you're wasting, again, a lot of energy, 20%. And here again, gallium nitride and the new generation of electronic systems can, can, can really change everything. Here we have the world's energy consumption, world's energy consumption as a function of time. If we don't do anything, keeps increasing, and if we use gallium nitride for a new generation of power electronic systems, a new generation of electronic uh, systems that are more efficient when transforming electricity. And it can have a huge impact, close to 20% of the electricity can, can be saved. Again, thanks to uh, semiconductors and, and thanks to, to electricity. To, to, to new materials. And this is going to, to be, a, a, I believe, a, a, a very important revolution in, in, a, wide, in a wide variety of, of fields. Uh, for example, what, uh, a few of my students, uh, a couple of years ago, started a, a new company uh, called Kennedy's Electronics, uh, focused on commercializing uh, some of these new materials for power electronics, uh, and their goal is to save 20% of the world's electricity through, through advanced power electronics. And this is one, one of their first products. This is a, a battery charger for a laptop computers. And not only you can make them a lot more efficient than what we have today, but you can make them a lot smaller. So I, I'll pass it around. Uh, 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 and you can compare that battery charger with, with your own battery charger. And that's just the, the, the beginning. Let, let me skip a, a, a couple of slides in, in the interest of time. Uh, and let me tell you about the, the second opportunity that I see for, for electronics uh, and, and for advanced uh, new materials. Electronics has changed our lives. I mean, we, we have the internet, we have cell phones, we have computers, we, we have a DNA sequencing, all thanks to electronics. But I would argue that it's in very few places in our lives. We have a lot of electronics in, in displays, we have a lot of electronics now coming into lighting, of course, for computers, the internet, but 95% of the objects we own 95% of the objects in this room don't have electronics in them. There is no electronics on this stand. There is no electronics in my jacket. There is no electronics on, on, on these walls. And I think that's a huge opportunity if we want to increase the, the reach and the impact of, of electronics. The problem is that it, we would have to come up with a new technology, a new way of doing electronics if we want to really bring electronics to every single object we, 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 we own. But if we could do that, there are a lot of new opportunities. We could, we could for example, have electronic wallpaper and desk that would allow to recharge 
uh, computers uh, and objects wirelessly. I would be able to place this laptop anywhere in this room and it would charge automatically. I would be able to, to buy a, a, a new flat screen TV, hang it anywhere, and the electronics embedded in the wall would find the, would find the display and route the electricity exactly where, where it is needed. Instead of having lighting as we have it today, based on light bulbs, you could think of a photoluminescent ceiling that would give a much more pleasant uh, uh, feeling, etc. Et the question is how, how to do that. And, and for, that, for, for that, to enable that vision for future electronics, you need new semiconductor materials. You need a new way of making electronic devices. Because what we have today, based on silicon or gallium nitride, just be way too expensive in order to be able to wrap this entire building with silicon wafers. Just too expensive. Luckily, we have a new generation of materials that are just idea to enable this issue. And these are called two-dimensional two -dimensional materials. Ten years ago, it was discovered that it is possible to have a material made of just one atom of carbon. One single atom thick layer of carbon. And that's called graphene. It's the thinnest material in the world. And as we are going to see, it, it, it's truly amazing. And that was the beginning. Years later, we discovered that graphene is not enough. There is a wide variety of materials that are just one atom thick, and we can use them for the next generation of, of electronics. And not only we can use them as standalone, but we can start stacking them to do interesting things. So as I said, these are the thinnest materials in the world, made of just one atom in thickness. Because of that, they are transparent, and they are completely flexible. Just one atom. Uh, they are also the strongest materials in, in the world. And uh, my colleague, uh, Professor uh, James Horn from Columbia University, uh, has done the, this calculation that predicts that if you make a, a film out of graphene, the thickness of a salad wrap, basically the, the plastic foil that we use to, to wrap a food, if you make it that thick, it would be strong enough to take the weight of an elephant. And I believe he went to the New York Zoo and took an elephant <laughs> and he did the experiment <laughs> himself. Uh, on top of that, these materials are, are actually semiconductors and we can do regular electronics with them. Uh, they are also the, the best thermal conductors in, in, in the world. And they can carry a lot of carbon. And not only they have amazing properties, if you look at any of these properties, it's orders of magnitude better than any other material we, we know. But they also have completely new physics that allow you to have completely <coughs> new opportunities. So let, let me tell you what we can do with these materials. And, and the Nobel Prize in, in physics a, a few years ago, 2010, was given to the two scientists who were able to, to isolate a graphene for, for the first time. And since then, there has been a lot of growing interest in these materials. This is the number of scientific publications as a function of time for these materials. They, they, it has grown exponentially since 2005. And organizations and governments all around the world are investing really large amounts uh, to, to further develop this. Stuff. But let me tell you what we can do with it. Uh, uh, um, before that, let me tell you how we can get access to these amazing materials. It turns out that it's very easy for any of you to, to get graphene. It's very easy to get this amazing one atom thick material. You just take graph. Basically, you just take a pencil, and you pick the, 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 the lead in, in the pencil. That, that's graphite. And it turns out that a, that a pencil lead is made of one atom thick layers of graphene, which basically stack one on top of each other to make graphite, just in the same way that the cards 
stack on top of each other to make a bank of cards. So the easiest way for, for any of you to, to, to get one layer of graphene is just to take the top layer of a piece of graphene. It's very easy once that you know how to do it. If you would have come up with the idea in 2003, you will get uh, the Nobel Prize. <laughs> so the idea is what is technically known as the Scotch tape uh, technique, which involves the, the following very high tech uh, steps. You first take a graphite, basically your, your pencil uh, lead, and Scotch tape. And then you take a, a small piece of scotch tape, one, one square centimeter, works the best. And you basically press the, the scotch tape a, a, against the, the graphite. And then you remove it very slowly. I have to say that after graphene was, was uh, discovered through, through, through this method, the, 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 the price of, of uh, it's <laughs> basically went like crazy. I, I, I wish I would have invested in, in 3M. Uh, so, so you get the scotch tape, you, you press against, and they are getting so much free publicity. Uh, you, you press and you remove it very slowly, and, and then you go to the microscope and, and you look at the, the, the scotch tape, and anyone other than a, a, a Nobel laureate kind of person would say this is junk, this is completely useless. But if you decide the Nobel Prize, you would say, oh, this could be interesting. Then you, you take that scotch tape with, with a lot of junk, and, and then you, you press it against a silicone wafer or any other flat surface. And then you remove the scotch tape very, very slowly. And if you are really lucky, some of this junk will transfer to the silicone. Um, if you deserve the normal price, you will say, okay, let, let's take a look more closely, uh, uh, and you zoom in, and you see that you have flakes, you have different kinds of, of, of stuff on top of the wafer, and if you look very, very carefully, you will see that not all these particles have exactly the same color. Uh, and basically, if you are very careful, you will see that there are some regions of, of these particles that are very, very big. And if you look at them carefully, they are actually made of just one atom thick material. So as I said, it's very easy for any of you to get graphene. You just take lead, scotch tape, it, get some junk on top of the scotch tape, you, you put it on, on, on a flat surface, remove it, look under the microscope, find regions that are very, very faint, that's a one atom thick material. And it's amazing to me to think that you can actually see that with the naked eye, that you can. So what do we do with, with that uh, material? Uh, 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 there has been a lot of work on, on improving the quality of that material. Be believe it or not, this scotch tape method, uh, even though it's good to, to give you the Nobel Prize, it cannot be used by industry. Somehow the, the claim is not scalable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Uh, so uh, scientists around the world had, had to come up with methods to scale up the production of uh, this two-dimensional material. Uh, and in Spain, we are very fortunate to, to have uh, several companies that, that are leading the, the, the world on how to grow the, the, this graphene material, one of them is graphenea, but there are a, a few others, uh, that allow us to, to basically have high quality, high quality material that can be used by, by engineers. Then there has been a lot of work in the physics of these materials, and then making devices and, and systems. My, my own group tries to focus on this area, trying to come up with new applications for, for these truly amazing materials. And now I'm going to give you a, a, couple, a couple of examples of, of things we, we are doing. So we, we are very interested in what is called mid and long infrared detection. Basically, we are very interested in making a camera that can take pictures 
in the infrared range of, 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 of the spectrum. And you may ask, what, why? why? Why do we care about that? Turns out that there are many different applications. The, the easiest one to, to imagine is actually military kind of application for night vision. It turns out that every object uh, emits light in the mid-infrared. So if you have a camera that is sensitive to, to this wavelength, you can actually see in the dark. So there are many applications there. Uh, also for medical imaging, uh, infrared uh, imaging is very important, as well as for chemistry. Uh, different materials emit and absorb light at different wavelengths of, of the spectrum. And if you are able to look at the how how the material absorbs light as a function of wavelength, you, you can determine what kind of material it is. Many applications. When I ask my friends, okay, out of all these, which one is going to be more relevant to society? They, they tell me, computer games. And, and then I ask, how is infrared uh, image related to computer games? And to be able to, to use computers in the future. And it's actually quite, quite straightforward. In the future, we are going to be able to control our computer or our cell phone by just waving our hands in front of the computer. I will be able to do this, and this slide will go to the next one. You will be able to, to do that, and in the game, you will be able to, 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 to basically hit someone. The question is how to enable that, how to enable gesture recognition. Right now, you can do that by using a regular webcam. The problem with that is that the image that the, the camera is capturing is very complex. It has the image of, 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 of my body, but then it also has the, the background. And it takes a lot of computational time and a lot of energy to be able to distinguish my body from the background and to be able to distinguish that I'm waving my hand in, in order to, to, to move the, 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 the geograph. In the future, instead of a full image of, 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 of the person, what you would like to do is actually get a thermal image of the person. Because if you get the thermal image, it's a lot easier to filter your body with respect to the background. The background is typically cold, especially here in, in Boston. <laughs> it, so it's a lot easier to get the image of, of the body, and it's a lot easier to basically be able to detect gesture. So in the very near term, every camera, every cell phone, every computer is going to have an infrared camera to do exactly that, gesture recognition. The only thing that is stopping this technology from really becoming mainstream is that today you need to pay the hundred thousand dollars for, for one of these cameras. And, and people don't want to pay that. <laughs> the solution is, is graphene. So what we have done in, in, in my group is make a one cheap infrared camera, really low cost, enabled by, by graphene. And to do that, we basically made a state-of-the-art silicon chip here we have a, a, a schematic of it. And once that is fully fabricated, a regular, regular silicon chip, we put on top a one atom thick layer of, of graphene. And then we made infrared detector on top. And this is one image of, of, of the microchip. And each one of these dots is basically a graphene-based infrared detector. And we have 80 by 60 in this first demonstration. Uh, this is a close-up image of each one I mean, of a group of dots. This is a close-up image of one of these uh, dots. And basically, this works. And it's a, a single chip, a graphene silicon infrared detector designed for gesture recognition that will hopefully make it to, to your cell phones uh, very soon. So that's, if you ask me what is the first application where we are going to see this one atom thick material with really amazing properties and that you can use to, to basically hold an elephant uh, uh, on a pencil, 
This is the first application. It, but it is the first of many. It, we are working on designing and demonstrating a wide variety of electronic circuits that will get us closer to this vision of having electronics everywhere. And I'm not going to get into the details, but basically we have radio receivers. This is the world's smallest radio receiver in the world. You, you can actually, let, let me see if this works. I'm not sure. So, Hi, so what you're going to hear now will be from the world's first graphene RF demodulator. So basically th this is the, the world's smallest radio radio receiver. It made of only one one atom. It's just one atom thick radio receiver. It's also the, the world's most expensive radio receiver <laughs> ever made. Uh, but we are working on, on the cost uh, issue. And uh, all kind of uh, different electronic circuits. We are also making displays. Again, th this is a, a material that is completely transparent. It's just one, one atom thick. But you can use it to, to make transparent displays. And it actually works. And when the display is off, it's perfectly transparent. When you turn it on, it starts emitting light. So in the future, our windows will be transparent, but will also work as displays. And you will be able to watch TV by just turning on the display in, in the window. And everything is done in a completely new form factor. Everything I'm talking about is transparent, can be done in very large areas, and is flexible. So it really changes the way we think of electronic systems. To the point that we are trying to embed electronics everywhere. My, my dream is the next time I go to, to a coffee shop, I, I get a coffee mug, and there will be electronics embedded in there. Uh, imagine you, you go to, to, to Starbucks, and, and you get the, the, the coffee, and, and in the coffee cup, you have a display embedded there, where you can watch the, 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 the latest news, or, or maybe some ads, or, or, or something. It, how can we do that? How can we embed electronics everywhere? It, we are using 3D printers. So 3D printing is a very interesting technique that allows you to, to quickly prototype three-dimensional objects. They are able to print plastic, uh, metals, uh, etc. But for a long time, I, I've said that, or I, I, I thought that 3D printing from an electrical engineering perspective was really boring. I couldn't do any computation. I, I couldn't do anything with it. It was just structural materials. It, what we are doing in collaboration with, with NASA is to modify a 3D printer to be able to print not only structural materials, not only the coffee mug out of plastic, but to be able to embed displays, to be able to embed sensors to tell you whether the coffee is too hot or not. You will no longer have that, that, that disclaimer of, careful, the, the, this is very hot. You will have an actual thermometer telling you exactly the temperature at which your, your coffee is, etc. Basically to bring electronics to every single object. To hopefully get us closer and closer to this vision that I have of truly ubiquitous electronics where we are able to increase the, the impact and the reach of electronics by 100x, 1000x, for, for a completely new, new, new era of, of microsystems. But before, before I conclude, in, in the last couple of minutes, let, let me tell you about the, our most recent project, because I, I, I'm, I'm very excited about it. Electronics has been fantastic. I mean, electronics ha has really changed our society. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is because we, we are able to make transistors really, really tiny. But le let's benchmark ourselves. Le let's, compare to, let's compare what we can do with electronics with what nature does in biology. 
So, for example, here, you, you have the, the amount of area that you need in order to store one bit of information, a one or a zero, in an electronic component. So, to store one bit of information, to store either one or zero in an electronic chip, today you need something like 0 0.01 microscope. You are able to store one tiny piece of information in 0 0.01 square microns. Really tiny. Let's look at what nature does. In DNA, nature is able to store information in a much denser form. So they are able to store one single piece of information, one, one B, in 0 0.000001 square microns. So at least four orders of magnitude denser than what we can do with conventional electronics. Nature, it, it's truly amazing. But things get even worse when we don't think of just one tiny bit of information, but we think of an entire system, something that does something useful. So the, 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 the smallest thing we can do today with, with electronics is a microchip. I mean, a microchip, maybe the, the smallest microchip uh, that can be useful is maybe one cubic micro in volume. Uh, sorry, one cubic millimeter in, in volume. So that, that's really the smallest thing we can do with electronics. You open your computer, the smallest possible thing is typically one, one cubic millimeter. Nature, on the other hand, is able to pack a lot of really amazing functionality into biological cells. In, in, in less than 10 cubic microns, you have a system that is able to get energy from the environment, do something useful with that energy, and communicate with other cells, a transfer information. Everything in less than 10 cubic microns. So, as I'm an electrical engineer and not a, a biologist, I, I try to find ways to make my electronic devices become more like biology, to be able to compete with biology. So what would have to change in order to build a system like this? A key difference between electronics and nature, a key difference between semiconductors and biology, is that everything we do in electronics, it's done on the plane. So all the transistors, all the microchips, everything we have made of electronics it is made on a single plane of silicon or, or a single plane of, of gallium nitride. Nature, on the other hand, so all these billions of transistors that you have there, they are just one next to the other. One here, one there, one there, one there, and everything on the same plane. Nature, on the other hand, is making systems that are highly foldable. So everything is made of proteins, and you are folding the proteins hundreds and thousands of times to, to, to get extremely dense systems, like, like biological systems. So I think if we want to have a chance to mimic biology in complexity, we need to learn how to fold our systems thousands of times to increase the density, the functional density of, of our uh, artificial uh, systems. And that's something that actually we can do for the first time by using these two-dimensional materials. Because these two-dimensional materials made of just one atom thick structures are really flexible. It's just made of one atom, so you can fold it over and over and over again. They are the most flexible materials in the world. They are even more flexible than proteins. So we just got a, a new project to basically take our circuit, the circuits I was talking about, the radio receiver I was talking about, the sensors I didn't have time to talk about, and, and start folding them over and over again and try to engineer that folding, try to have origami, with these 2D circuits, to come out with what I like to call artificial organelles. 
So in a biological cell, these building blocks are called organelles. And what we want to do is, by using origami of two-dimensional materials, we want to come up with a gener new generation of artificial organelles that we can combine into <coughs> a new kind of microsystem, which is going to have the same shape, form factor, than biological cells. And we think this may be closer than, than uh, we, we would have expected a few years ago. So in, in summary, uh, and to conclude, I, I think we, we are at the most exciting time to, to be working on, on electronics in, in history, because the rules and the, the approaches that have enabled electronics to grow exponentially for the last 60 years are no longer there. We, have, we are about to reach, if not already, the saturation in the conventional technologies. But at the same time that we are saturating conventional electronics, we are opening the world, the, we are opening the door to a completely new world of new materials and new opportunities to completely redefine what it is possible with, with electronic uh, microsystems. And that's some of the work that we try to do in, in my group at uh, uh, the uh, Thank you. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you, Tomas. Um, there are any questions? Comments? So I have a, a couple of questions. First of, all, well, first of all, how out of that is this material? I mean, is, has there been any study like to you think like a whole world cover of electronics? Is there enough to do that? Mm -hmm. A second, and it's related, how about the disposal of those materials? I mean, mm -hmm. if you increase the materials so much, how do you? Excellent question. I mean, graphene is nothing but carbon. So it, it, it's just a one atom thick layer of carbon. Uh, and there is plenty of carbon in, in, in the world. Uh, uh, and not only that, not only there is plenty of carbon, but a one atom thick is really thin. I mean, one atom, I mean, we, we keep talking about atoms uh, all the time. Uh, but we need to, to stop for one second and, uh, and think what a one atom thick material means. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you take all the carbon in my body and, and, and you make a one atom thick layer with, with that, it could cover the entire wall. I'm pretty sure of that. So, so yeah, we have plenty, plenty of material. But it, it is a, a, a very important question. Maybe not that much for, 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 for graphene, but for gallium nitride, for example. The gallium is a lot more scarce that, that, that can. Uh, and people are, are very worried about gallium and about a related material called indium, which is e even more difficult to, to get. Very, very important. Thank you. Yeah. So, what's, what's the industry that we see more future with graphene? Um, I, I think the, the, there are many different applications that will benefit from, from this one atom thick material. My personal feeling is that the, the first application of, of high level of complexity that will become available is, is the one I mentioned of, of infrared, infrared uh, detectors. But there are actually applications that use graphene that are available today. So for example, people are using graphene to reinforce materials. And there are tennis rackets today that claim are using graphene to increase the strength of, of, of the tennis racket. Uh, and they promise to, to, to make a, a tennis champion uh, out of anyone who uses it. <laughs> I haven't tried. But, but graphene is amazing material, so who knows? <laughs> Two questions. Uh, the first one is like, you mentioned that like, graphene is like the reaching out to the waste uh, of energy uh, by reducing the temperature that Thomas heat produced. How do you do that? Uh, how is it that works? And the, the second question is more focused on health. Uh, so if we have now electronics in all the world, 
there are many people who suffer from uh, EMF, electromagnetic field uh, illnesses. How is like your field is interacting with the uh, medical field to understand this uh, very, very, very interesting questions. Um, regarding the, the, the first one on, on energy, the, 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 easy, the simplest example is the one with lighting. Uh, basically, between 25 and 35 percent of all the electricity in the world is really wasted uh, as heat in incandescent light bulbs. So if you can use gallium nitrogen instead, you, you are saving a, a lot of that energy. Also, in, in power electronics, the, the electronics that you use to, to transform electricity from the, the megavolts that, that you have in, in, the, in, the, in the grid down to the 18 volts that I need in, in, the, in the computer. The problem is that, I said, a transistor is basically a, a switch. It's either open, stops the current, or lets the current flow. The problem is that with conventional electronics, when the transistor lets the current flow, it's actually more like a resistor than a real wire, a perfect wire. So what all these new materials do is make the switch closer to an ideal wire. And in that way, you can reduce the, 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 the energy that is wasted. To, to answer, so the, the second question, what was the second question? Yeah, yeah. Oh, the health care. Very good. Um, it's something that we, we need to, to, to work with, uh, very closely with, with health uh, professionals. But typically, if, if we were to, to really wrap the, the entire building and the entire wall with, with electronics, it, to, we need to be careful to make sure that it wouldn't consume a lot of energy. So that means that because the area is so huge, the amount of energy per unit of area is going to be really, really tiny. So the amount of potential radiation that we are talking about, electromagnetic radiation that these electronics could generate, is going to be really, 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 really tiny. Because all, otherwise, we wouldn't have enough energy in the entire world to, to power this. So because of that, I, 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 I don't think a electromagnetic radiation will, will be too much of an issue. A, However, it's important to work with health professionals, especially when working with nanomaterials, materials that are really, really tiny. We need to understand how the human body and the cells inside the body interact with graphene and other materials like those. Like, like it's very, very important. So far, things look very promising in the sense that they seem to be biocompatible. We, we took a piece of graphene and we grew uh, cells on top and they were very happy. Uh, but it, more work needs to be done. Um, thank you very much for this okay. fantastic seminar. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. 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 Thank I, I studied with, with a professor, his name was, uh, or his name is uh, Professor Her Herbert Cromer uh, at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, professor Cromer is a Nobel laureate in, in physics. And he basically discovered, or he invented the, the semiconductor laser. This laser you have there, uh, invented by, by him. Uh, and and he, he always says that the best application for a completely new technology will only be discovered many years after the initial technology is in place. Uh, and when I talk to him about this, he, he tells me that, you see, when, when he discovered the, the semiconductor laser, people thought that it was completely useless. Who would care about a tiny dot of light being projected on, on, on the wall? And it was only years later when they invented the optical fiber. That people thought, oh, we can connect the semiconductor laser with the optical fiber. And that really started the, the communication revolution that has enabled cell phones and the internet, etc. Many years had to pass before finding 
the best application for the semiconductor base. Uh, for, for these biological like cells that I, I'm talking about, what the application is, I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm completely sure that once the technology is there, uh, we, we will be able to find really amazing opportunities. Also, congratulations, great talk. I, I have a couple of questions in terms of the timeline. This room of the future, which I loved, when would you think that this is a, could be a reality? Do you have an estimate of how that could be a reality? Like it, 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 it typically takes 20 years from the time a new material is discovered to the time where that particular material makes a huge impact in society. 20 years. And there are many, many examples that basically show that it's 20 years plus minus five. The, the, those, that's the bad news. 20 years sounds like a lot. The, the, the good news is, is that graphene was first isolated in 2005. So it's already a 10-year-old material. So we are almost there. We, we are getting there. How long does it last? I wonder, is this something that will get old and every so often you will need to change the walls? Or is, is this something, I know, I wonder if it has a lasting life or it's something that is, it can go for many years? From, from that point of view, these inorganic cells that I'm talking about are different from organic cells. Organic cells suffer a lot from oxy, <coughs> because of oxygen and so on. So they, they degrade. Uh, inorganic materials don't degrade that easy. So, so yeah, hopefully yeah. They, it, it, it will last. Okay. I guess it's probably an investment to buy one of these houses <laughs> if you want to be sure. Graphene like diamonds for an entire life. No, but, but you, you, you see, um, you, it doesn't really need to last a lifetime mm -hmm. because something we are working on is pain that has these materials embedded in it. So you paint your house, and at the same time that you paint it, you are coding it with solar cells, for example. Yeah, is there any research about how to harvest energy with TV kind of materials in order to, I mean, to power the new electronics? Yeah, yeah. Any electromagnetic radiation or whatever? Absolutely. What is called energy harvesting is extremely important. I mean, if you are going to have electronics everywhere, you, you better find a way to, to, to bring energy to power that, because otherwise you're going to have a lot of long wires everywhere. Uh, from that point of view, uh, solar energy uh, seems very, very promising, especially if you can code every surface with, with a solar cell. So we are working quite a lot on, on, on that. But what about, what, I, I mean, the, the, the amount of electromagnetic uh, feel that that's surrounding us, like, I mean, uh, red white lens or whatever. I mean, because sometimes we need to, to, to power our electronics during the night. So, mm -hmm. is there any experiments you have thought to swing that the sound would be like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's called RF energy harvesting. So, you try to harvest energy that is in the form of electromagnetic radiation already in, in the environment. Uh, and we are definitely working working on that. Uh, you need to be careful because the amount of RF energy that is in the environment is very, very, very tiny. Uh, but you, you can definitely harvest some of that, uh, uh, and also you can have transmitters to, to, to send energy uh, exactly where you need it. Very, very important. I've also heard that one of the problems with, with graphene is the storage. Precisely because it's the one atom, it's so difficult to store the material and to keep it in place. I don't know if this is an issue or something that. Uh... Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm sorry, I should, I should have brought uh, some, some graphene with, with, with me. It, it's quite, quite stable. Uh, 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 it's really, really impressive to, to, to have it on, on, on a piece of glass and to be able to, to see this one atom thick material with, with your naked eye. It is very, very stable. 
so storage, I, I think it, it is quite 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 straightforward. Uh, although typically, to, to make sure these materials don't degrade, you typically cover them on top with some really stable material to protect them from, from scratches and, and so on. I mean, it's very strong. As I said, it's the strongest material we, we know of. But because it's very thin, you can break it quite, quite easily. So you, you, you typically cover them to, to protect them. this new material and this industry are going to uh, impact the old way of producing an it, it, It's going to, to, to be very interesting. It's going to, to be very interesting to, to, to see if the incumbent uh, uh, companies, if the companies that are, are big today will be able to adapt quickly enough to this new generation of, of, of electronics and, and energy producing systems, or not? I, 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 I don't know the answer. I, I think that there are huge opportunities for a new generation of startup companies to, to basically become the, 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 the big companies of, of tomorrow. I, I, I'm completely convinced about that. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. To, to, to see what happens in, in, in five and ten years. It will be very interesting. Mm -hmm. I have a very last question, and it's a little bit more technical, but so the basics of uh, electronics is having semiconductors, right? Which uh, actually graphene is not. I mean, it's a zero cap conductor. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how are we fixing this? How are we opening the gap of graphene to have a real semiconductor? Very good so there are many options, but what is for you, for you in your opinion, like the best choice? My, my choice, this is more a philosophical question. <laughs> my choice in life is always never fight against nature. Nature always wins. <laughs> so if you need a semiconductor to make transistors, uh, and Graphene is not a semiconductor. My approach is don't, don't, don't fight against nature. Uh, look for, for a different solution. And the good news is that graphene is not alone. It was the first material, this, it was the first one atom thick material that has been isolated, but it's not the only one. Now we have a huge family of new materials with properties that are very unique and some of them are, are perfect semiconductors. So don't fight against nature. Don't try to make graphing into something it doesn't want to be. Just choose the brother of graphing or the cousin of graphing because they, they may be good enough for your needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.